I'm Michael Nock from the Goldman School, and it's a special treat for me on behalf of our institution to welcome you to the special distinguished visiting lecture. I could spend a lot of time telling you about things much of which you already know about the accomplishments of our speaker, so I was going to avoid that. Instead, I just want to spend a couple of minutes giving you an inside look at how speakers are selected for this kind of event. Berkeley, as you know, is an extremely collaborative institution, and very few people are in a position to make decisions on their own. At the Goldman School, we had a group of about eight or ten people who collaborated in trying to figure out who should we select to give this lecture. And there were very varied views about this matter. One view, which was not surprising, was, look, we have to have someone who has unquestioned academic pedigree. This is Berkeley. And it shouldn't be from Berkeley, because we have so many people from Berkeley who speak. And so so we, maybe someone from the East Coast, the Ivy League, uh, you know, perhaps Dartmouth. Uh, <laughs> it's a possibility. Uh, certainly a Rhodes Scholar would be good. A Yale Law School honor graduate, that would be good. So that was the first argument. Make it someone with pure academic pedigree. Someone else said, no, that's not, that's not so important. It doesn't really matter where they studied. What matters is what they've done. And particularly if they've, you know, written or published something like nine books. <laughs> something like that. That would be fantastic, you know. Someone else said, you know, you know the Berkeley theme. It's always, what have you done for us lately? So it doesn't matter what they publish in the past. They have to have some new book coming out, maybe in May. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would really be important. Others said, you know, of course, these are all great, uh, uh, great achievements, but it's all about quantity, and quantity you know, doesn't matter at Berkeley. What matters is quality. You, you need someone who's authored a book, let's take like the work of nations, that has been translated into 22 languages. That really shows quality, tremendous you know, influence and international uh, exposure. Others said, you know, we have so many standard academic lectures at Berkeley. We need someone who's a person of ideas, who's a public intellectual, but who reaches out to a broader audience through the more journalistic community. You know, maybe the co-founder of the American Prospect magazine might be one candidate. Someone else who's constantly in demand and is a regular on the NPR program Marketplace would be another, another example. So I was really scratching my head. I mean, these are a lot of, you know, conflicting uh, objectives. Others said, you know, we're a public policy school, and public policy gets into issues of politics and governance and the real world, the, the hurly-burly stuff of the federal government. Maybe someone who was very active in a transition team after a president was elected, you know, maybe someone who headed the economic transition team of a newly elected president like Clinton in 92. That would be a good, uh, good choice. About the seventh or eighth person said, uh, you know, none of this really matters. We need someone who's actually achieved cabinet rank, who's actually held a cabinet level position in our government, like uh, Secretary of Labor. For th that might be a possibility. Others said, you know, uh, this is all well and good, but the fact of the matter is that in the real world, it's, it's often people who have been in the political hurly-burly themselves, not just advising, but who've actually run for office, state office, maybe governor of Massachusetts. <laughs> this would be the kind of person we want to, want to hear from. And others said, you know what, as important as every one of these dimensions is, really the most important thing is someone who stands for something, who stands for values that we can all rally around. And values of the kind, let's say, of a person like the first president of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, an extraordinary figure. And uh, this person mentioned that in 2003, uh, the Václav Havel Prize for Distinguished Accomplishment in Social Thought was given to someone who would be a wonderful speaker. So finally I said, that's enough, I've had it, I get all your views, we're inviting Bob Reich, he's done all of that. Please welcome Robert Reich.
Michael, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight. I uh, am uh, so gratified and delighted to be spending the term here at Berkeley. Uh, and I am overwhelmed with the beauty of the place, the intellectual rigor, the excitement. The, uh, and many of you are from this intellectual community. Many of you are from the Bay Area. And I want to tell you also that spending January, February, March, and April <laughs> here <laughs> and not in Boston has been a wonderful experience in and of itself. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'm wearing a tie. I have to explain this to some of you. Uh, can you all hear me, by the way? Is there anybody who cannot hear me? Uh, I, was at a, I was at a reception just a little while ago, and somebody, I had one of my standard red ties on. And he said, no, 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 you have to wear, you can't wear a red tie to a Berkeley event. <laughs> and he gave me his tie. <laughs> and it's, anyway, I'm delighted to be here. I, I chose for my topic tonight uh, something that would be topical, uh, maybe a little bit provocative, uh, and also academic in the sense that I would not play a partisan role. This is actually, I mean, after all, uh, this is a, 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 an academic institution in which not prescription, political prescription, not what we should be doing, but what we will experience. Prediction is more in the offing and more appropriate, and th therefore tonight I am going to be making some predictions, educated predictions. Uh, predictions about politics and a little bit about economics. Uh, predictions about, for example, our next president, who will be, and I will explain why, a Massachusetts liberal. Now, it, it, no, this isn't a matter, this is a matter of prediction. This is not a matter of whether you like it or not. I'm glad that some of you like my prediction, uh, but it's, just, it's, a, it's an educated prediction. I, I, I know these things, and I should tell you why I am able to make this kind of prediction, just so you can evaluate uh, the sagacity that I bring to bear on this particular issue. Uh, it is not only uh, the fact that I've spent half of my life in uh, academe studying uh, researching, analyzing politics and economics. Uh, it's not that I've spent the other half of my adult life actually in politics, uh, doing and making economic and political various policies, uh, but it's also that I have got something of repu reputation as being a soothsayer. <laughs> and I, I must warn you, actually, uh, my experience is a basis for some of my predictions. My soothsaying ability is something you should not pay attention to, but I, I do want to clear up, for the sake of the record, uh, this issue about my soothsaying ability. It all goes back to the first week of October of 1987. I don't know how many of you remember that. Some of you were alive then. I think most of you, some of you remember that. Some of my students have no memory of that at all. But the first week of October of 1987, you remember what happened the third week of October of 1987. Some of you economic historians, maybe you remember. We had something called a, euphemistically called a correction. <laughs> I love a correction in the stock market. But the first week of October of 1987, I was on a, a television program. It was a yelling program. I occasionally <laughs> go on to these yelling programs <laughs> and I yell and somebody yells back and I yell and they yell back and I leave and I don't even know what I say half the time because of <laughs> just yelling. But on this one particular yelling program, the issue that we were yelling about is what, and I, there is a tape of this program, what is going to happen to this extraordinary bull market we had then in 1986, 1987. What's going to happen? And I was opposite another economic, an economic forecaster actually, who was warning people, well actually quite the contrary, wasn't warning, he was saying uh, this bull market is going on for I mean, it's just, we've just seen the beginning, it's just going to be over the next two, three weeks, over the next month, it's going to go out of control. Get in the market. Get in the market. If you're in the market, get in more deeply in the market. Don't even wait to the end of this program to call your broker. Get in. 
It came to my turn, and I disagreed. I said, no, I, it's absolutely wrong. At least over the interim, over the short-term future, over the next couple of months, it's going to be a, terribly, a terrible bear market. In fact, in the next two weeks, two weeks from now, the Dow is going to lose 20% of its value. I said that. There is a tape. First week of October, 1987. And then, two weeks later, in fact, I was so adamant, I read in, on this tape I said, don't get out of the market, get out now, don't even wait till the end of this program to call your broker. <laughs> in retrospect, I don't think anybody saw the end of the program. <laughs> but two weeks later, two weeks later, exactly, the Dow plunged 20%. And I was deluged with letters and phone calls and people wanting to sign up for my investment letter. I told them, I told them uh, with some regret, I told them politely, I don't have an investment letter. It was sad. Uh, but what I did not tell them, and, and my soothsaying, my both economic and political soothsaying reputation comes in part from that incident. Uh, but what I did not tell them, and I have not admitted publicly before this, and I am going to say it now, but I want to ask you to please keep it within this room. <laughs> that that prediction I had made, that within two weeks, the Dow is going to lose 20% of its value. I had been making exactly the same prediction for four and a half years. <laughs> I, I missed the bull market completely, which, <laughs> which, 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 which proves a point, which is in the, in the game of both economic and political forecasting, if you stick to your guns, <laughs> eventually you can have your own newsletter, <laughs> make a lot of money. Uh, now, economic, uh, politi economic predictions are one thing. Uh, you know, th there are two kinds of people when it comes to economic predictions. Those who don't know the future, and those who don't know they don't know the future. And I'm certainly in the, in the first category. Uh, with regard to political predictions, though, I have been, my record is much, much better. Uh, and there is a record of my record. Uh, beginning uh, when I was 14 years old in 1960, I made my first prediction that a Massachusetts liberal would be president. I made another prediction in 1988, was not quite as <laughs> successful. Uh, but uh, let me explain this prediction. And, and for the purposes of the academy, since we are in an academic setting, I want to I kind of uh, look at this prediction and uh, deconstruct it a little bit for you. Because Massachusetts, a, a lot of people say it's impossible for a president to be elected from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Now, I, I want to state very clearly and baldly that that is simply not true. We have had several presidents from Massachusetts. John Adams, John Quincy Adams, <laughs> John F. Kennedy. It is possible for somebody to be elected from Massachusetts. And Massachusetts, and I say this uh, in part because I ran for governor and failed, to run for, to win in Massachusetts. But Massachusetts is a wonderful state. It, it is the home of, uh, it was the home of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and, and Henry, and, uh, and Henry Thoreau and, and others, well, Henry David Thoreau. A lot of, a lot of wonderful, wonderful things have emanated from Massachusetts. The Red Sox. I mean, think. <laughs> Let's try that again. The Red Sox. Now see, oh, here's another thing that's very important. A lot of you just then, you, you actually revealed your, re your Red Sox Massachusetts roots. And here's another interesting thing about Massachusetts. If you're running for Massachusetts for president, actually a huge portion of the nation left Massachusetts <laughs> and have roots in Massachusetts. In other words, one thing that, I, that occurred to me as I spent the last three or four months here was that my campaign slogan when I ran for governor, should have been, elect me, and I will lead you out of this godforsaken climate. <laughs> and many, but how many of you actually, either you yourself or you have relatives or ancestors who are from Massachusetts? Look at that, a, a clear majority. Uh, also, be, besides that, it, you know, there, were day, there was a time, and we, we tend in politics to base our predictions almost entirely on the basis of recent history. Uh, Carter, uh, Bill Clinton, the assumption being you've got to be a southerner, 
But you don't have to be a Southerner and a Demo if you want a Democratic president. Uh, and a lot of that recent history is simply uh, based upon the fact that the South has gone through a transition from, as you know, from Republican to Democrat. The critical states are not the southern states. The critical states are the Midwestern states. Those are the swing states. It is Ohio and Pennsylvania uh, and Missouri and Michigan and Wisconsin and so on. These are the states that must be won if you are going to be president. Uh, we tend here in the Bay Area or in Massachusetts or on the East Coast or West Coast, I, I don't know why it is that we've color-coded America so that the Republican states are red and the Democratic states are blue. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, but nevertheless, those of us from the Bay Area or from Massachusetts, we tend to live in bubbles. We tend to talk to people and assume that our own political predilections are shared broadly. That is not the case. So my prediction that a Massachusetts liberal will be president is not based upon discussions uh, or a free-floating focus group that I've had in the Bay Area <laughs> or in Massachusetts. Uh, in fact, when I, when, I, when I drove out here in January with my elder son, we passed through Red America. We passed through uh, places like Oklahoma City, uh, like uh, Des Moines, places uh, like uh, Amarillo, Texas, uh, places where people don't share many of the views that presumably some of you may share. And I actually did carry on a kind of free-floating focus group uh, about American politics because my son and I would be eating someplace and people recognizing me, I think from the Clinton administration and because I am somewhat unique in height, uh, they would come up and they'd sit down and they'd say, um, you know, they'd start, usually people start in the middle of a conversation. They actually start, they'd say, well, what do you think about the Iraqi war? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And then I would use those introductions uh, all the way through the Midwest and the West and the, all the way through blue, so-called blue or red America. I would use them as the beginnings of a real focus group. And I think we have about 11 or 12 discussions, my son and I with people who came up to us. Uh, and they were all Republicans. And they, I asked them the same questions. I said, why are you Republican? They said, because we feel that family values are important and we feel this and we feel that. Do you, what do you admire about George W. Bush? Almost every single person we met in this free-floating focus group said, we admire and are for him because of his honesty. <laughs> I said, well, why, why are you not a Democrat? We think Democrats, and this is 11 or 12 separate conversations, all almost identical, right from uh, the Mississippi River all the way through Texas. Why are you against Democrats? Because Democrats are immoral. Why are Democrats immoral? And they all gave me the same answer. One, because of abortion. Secondly, gay marriage. And third, Monica Lewinsky. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was very interesting. But I still think a Massachusetts liberal is going to be uh, the next president. Uh, again, it doesn't matter any longer where you are from. In fact, I've heard that you can be governor of a state of, even like California, not even be from America. From a, you can be from Austria. Uh, uh, people are paying less and less attention to where people are from. We have a president now who is putatively from Texas, but actually, as you know, was brought up in Connecticut and Maine. Place means less and less. But more importantly, in terms of deconstructing my prediction, is the word liberal. It is not a good word in American politics. About 17% of Americans describe themselves as liberals, as opposed to about 25 or 26% who describe themselves as conservatives. Now this is curious to me, and on the face of it, that would seem that it would be almost impossible for somebody who was liberal to become president of the United States. But go back in history just a little bit. In fact, bear with me. I want to I introduce to you uh, 
some definitions. Liberal was used by George Washington, that word liberal, to indicate a person of generosity or broad-mindedness, as opposed to those who wanted to deprive Catholics and Jews of their constitutional rights. Franklin D. Roosevelt defined a liberal this way. He said, say that civilization is a tree which as it grows continuously produces rot and dead wood. The radical says, cut it down. The conservative says, don't touch it. The liberal says, let's prune so that we lose neither the old trunk nor the new branches. There it was, Tony Blair's third way, right there in 1936. <laughs> but then liberalism came under fire, and it didn't come under fire in the 1980s or 1990s, it certainly did, but that wasn't the start of it. Uh, in fact, my first experience uh, in Berkeley was in 1968. I moved here for the, for the summer of 1968. I had been working in American politics. Uh, in fact, uh, I was teaching assistant for an architect, a professor of architecture here at Berkeley named Sim van der Rijn. I don't know how many of you know Sim. He continues to be a... Was that the Red Sox fan? <laughs> he continues to be a, a very good friend. And, uh, but that, as I came into Berkeley for the first time I'd ever been here in the summer, actually it was in June of 1968, uh, I, my nose picked up not only the delicious aromas of eucalyptus and jasmine, but also the provocative aroma of tear gas. And I thought, I've made it. <laughs> I'm here. But the 1960s, you will remember, were a time where being a liberal was not something to be celebrated, but it was people on the left who despised liberals, the militant Organizer Saul Alinsky described a liberal as someone, quote, who leaves the room when a fight begins. Wishy-washy liberals. Liberals who didn't have any spine. Limousine liberals. Mow-mowing the flak catchers, in Tom Wolfe's immortal phrase. As early as 1976. Now, by the way, it was that 1960s era in which liberalism not only was attacked from the left, but it also began to be attacked by the right. There almost was no, there were no defenders, as I remember, of liberalism in the late 1960s, early 1970s. By 1976, Mo Udall said, Representative Mo Udall said that although he continued to think of himself as a liberal, he used the term progressive to define himself. This is 1976, because he said liberal was associated, liberal is associated with abortion, drugs, busing, and big spending, wasteful government. 1976, I call myself a progressive. I feel that I am a liberal in my heart, but I call myself a progressive because the term has been so discredited. And then we come to the 1980s. I'm now going to quote to you from a book that is not yet a classic, <laughs> but it's going to be out in three weeks, and I hope some of you are moved. <laughs> it's called Reason. Reason. Uh, why, subtitled, Why Liberals Will Win the Battle for America. And. I wrote the book because I was interested in not only political ideology and the origins of political ideology, but I was interested in why we had come in this country to the point we are, uh, where such shrillness dominates public debate, where values that I certainly never thought could possibly be dominant uh, appear to dominate the highest reaches of both Congress and the executive branch and many of our state governments. And I also was interested in where the screeds were coming from. Listen to this. The liberal catechism includes a hatred of Christians, guns, the profit motive, and political speech, and an infatuation with abortion, the environment, and race discrimination. Liberals hate flag wavers, they hate abortion opponents, they hate all religions except Islam.
That's Ann Coulter. Here's another one. The American people reject what is abnormal or perverted, including commie libs, feminizers, and environmental wackos. They're all liberals, and we don't need them anymore. That great American Rush Limbo. In fact, liberalism and liberals have come in for more negative screeds, more bitterness, more anger than almost anybody else. And yet, ironically, only 17% of Americans call themselves liberals. Where are the liberals? That is, where are the liberal elites that are supposedly running everything? I can't find them. <laughs> I don't know where they are. Robert Bork is somebody who I had the privilege of working for when I left law school. Robert Bork was at that time Solicitor General of the United States, and he asked me to come down and be his assistant. And I went to Washington. Uh, he had just, not when he asked me to come, but when I arrived, he had just fired Archibald Cox. You can imagine what I felt myself and found myself in the middle of. And I enjoyed working for him. We did not agree on everything. In fact, uh, Robert Bork and I, when I worked for him, uh, arguing and also briefing cases before the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States, we disagreed on the first, fourth, fifth, eighth, and ninth amendments to the Constitution. <laughs> but he was, he was still a, a, a fascinating person to work for. Uh, but he wrote a book that has become something of a Bible among radical conservatives. Uh, and that book was actually published in 1996. It's called Slouching Toward Gomorrah. But I want to read you something that suggests where the anger, and this is something else that I was very curious about, where does the anger come from? I mean, there's a lot of anger in all of this liberal bashing. Listen to this. The temporary abeyance of the 60s temper was due to the radicals graduating from the universities and becoming invisible until they reached positions of power and influence, as they now have, across the breadth of the culture. They no longer have need for violence or confrontation since the liberals now control the institutions they formerly attacked. The 60s temper manifests itself now in subtler but no less destructive ways. And then he goes on to attack Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham Clinton. The spirit of the 60s revived in the 80s and brought us at last to Bill and Hillary Clinton. The very personifications of the 60s generation arrived at early in middle age with its ideological baggage intact. Therein, it seems to me, lies some of the clue I believe that a lot of the anger, a lot of the screeds, a lot of the animus comes from a revolt that began in the 60s, a revolt against the permissiveness, against the cultural permissiveness of the 1960s, and also against what happened and perceived to be an American humiliation in Vietnam. As I read Bork's words, I was reminded of sitting in Bork's class in Yale Law School, sitting with Bill and Hillary, sitting with Clarence Thomas. We were all in the same class together in Robert Bork's classroom. And we were not radicals. We had never been radicals. We were the very personifications of young people who wanted to be public servants, who wanted to reform the system, anything but radicals. Bill Clinton and Hillary were anything. Never, never, never were radicals. Where are the 60s radicals? They grew up, most of them. A few of them migrated to a few enclaves where you still see faded hippies, aging hippies. Some of you may be in that category. <laughs> but most of them are normal Americans who sell insurance or aluminum siding and have given up most of their radicalism. And I, in my campaigns in Massachusetts and in my travels around the country, come across a lot of them. You know the theory of the phantom limb. What happens when you lose an arm or a finger 
Neurologists understand this. Very often when somebody loses, for whatever reason, an arm or a hand or some other limb, they still feel as though they have it. It's called a phantom limb. They act as though they almost subconsciously, their nervous system still believes it has that arm or that hand. And the rights, feelings, and assumptions about the 1960s and the 1960s radicals, it seems to re reflect that same phantom limb. It doesn't exist any longer. Liberal elites are not there. These are phantoms. But they're phantoms that potentially reflect upon a real phenomenon, a phenomenon that occurred and has occurred over the last 25 years that is a real problem to many people who give a sympathetic ear to the Ann Coulters and the Rush Limbaugh's and a lot of the radical right. And I'm talking about white men without college degrees who have seen their economic fortunes continue to decline as the global economy and the high technology economy impose enormous burdens on them. Democrats and liberals, rather than respond to this very large and growing crisis in terms of where so many non-college Americans have found themselves, particularly white Americans and particularly white men, instead defaulted and allowed the other side to blame and use the culture of resentment to blame others, whether those others be blacks and affirmative action or women and feminism or foreign traders, or immigrants, or whatever you wanted to blame, use that culture of resentment and ultimately to blame liberals and to blame Bill and to blame Hillary and to blame the 1960s for what has happened. Now interestingly, most Americans, although they don't describe themselves as liberals, most Americans actually believe in many of the principles and tenets and values that we are accustomed to associate with liberals. Let me give you, again, some examples from this brilliant, cogent, insightful book. <laughs> now, I am very skeptical, as I think some of you are and should be, about public opinion polling. And I use public opinion polling and quote public opinion polls only when I am fairly sure that they are representative of uh, a broad cross-section of the, of the populace. That is, where one poll is replicated by many, many other polls and all come to roughly the same conclusion. So the polling that I'm going to give you right now is representative. It's not just a single poll. It is a poll that is reflected in many other polls done by many different polling organizations. For example, Question, do you think homosexual relations between consenting adults should or should not be legal? An overwhelming percentage of the public says they should be legal. How about abortion? Should the choice of abortion be left up to the woman and her doctor, or should it be legal in cases only where pregnancy results from rape or incest, or been illegal in all cases? Well, it turns out that 59%, 60% of Americans believe that abortion should be up to a woman and her doctor. 29% say only in cases of rape, incest, life of the woman at stake, and 9% say it should always be illegal. Which one of the following three statements comes clearer to your view, that the United States is a Christian nation, the United States is a biblical nation, or it is a secular nation, or you don't know? 29% say a Christian nation, 16% say a biblical nation, 45% a secular nation, and 10% don't know. Let me give you a few others of this flavor, just so you get a flavor of where America is. Again, these are representative polls. These are not single polls. They represent a whole cluster of polls that say roughly the same thing. Which comes closer to your view? Government can promote the teachings of religion without harming the rights of people who do not belong to that religion, or 
Any time government promotes the teaching of a religion, it can harm the rights of people who don't belong to that religion. 40% say it can promote religion without harming rights. 54% say any promoting religion always harms rights. Do you think big companies have too much, too little, or about right influence when it comes to power and influence in Washington? 80% of Americans say big companies have too much influence. When it comes to dealing with the problems of the financial markets and major corporations, which do you think is the greater danger? That regulators will go too far and impose restrictions on business that will hinder the economy or that they will not go far enough toward raising the standards of accountability and restoring confidence in the markets. 36% say we'll go too far, 59% say they will not go far enough. As you may know, the First Amendment to the Constitution gives all Americans the right to free speech. Do you think the First Amendment also gives Americans the right to contribute as much money as they want to political parties and candidates? Or don't you think so? 40% say yes, it does give that right. 52% say no, it does not give that right. And we could go on. This cogent, insightful book only has an appendix with regard to these polls. But what I want to stress with you is that if you look at issues of economic policy, issues of the widening gap between rich and poor, issues concerning health care and the affordability of health care, issues concerning regulation of the environment, regulation of health and safety, issues concerning whether people who are working full time should earn enough to have an opportunity to get out of poverty. Or the war in Iraq. The war in Iraq. Interesting. Interesting. These are polls that were done actually right through, beginning in the first one is September 2003, but they go all the way through the following eight months, nine months. How concerned are you that new measures to fight terrorism in this country could end up restricting our individual freedoms? Very concerned, 34%, somewhat concerned, 32%, not too concerned, 19%, not concerned at all, 14%. As a result of U.S. military action against Iraq, do you think the threat of terrorism against the United States has increased, decreased, or stayed about the same? Now, this poll has been done and was done repeatedly, conducted September 18th, 19th, 2003, but conducted all the way through. The last one I've seen was about a month ago, and it stays pretty constant. 25% say the action in Iraq has increased the possibility and threat of terrorism. 17% say decreased. 55% say about the same. Most people don't consider themselves liberal, but most Americans actually, when it comes to individual issues, civil rights, civil liberties, regulation, the environment, the war, foreign policy, the doctrine of preemption, the doctrine of unilaterally acting without our allies. Most Americans actually come down on the side of values that we associate with liberal values. They are values that are not represented in the current administration. And hence, my point that a Massachusetts liberal has a very good chance now, let's examine, if we could, a policy and a set of policies of which, about which I know something. Now, I, I am not an expert in foreign policy. I can only tell you that as I look with horror on what's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan, I worry, as many of you do, that we are creating more anti-Americanism and fomenting terrorism around the world than we are doing anything to thwart it. But let's leave that issue to Michael Knox and to others that know something about that. Michael. <laughs> Excuse me. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> but look at economic policy for a moment. Now, we have now 
a federal budget deficit that is $500 billion a year as far as the eye can see. We also are about seven years away from the first group of baby boomers hitting retirement. Now, here is something that is not discussed a great deal, but ought to be discussed, because the baby boom generation, of which I am an early member, is moving through our population demographically like a pig through a python. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but it is coming up, but let's use a different metaphor. It's like a big wave, a giant wave. It's going to hit the shores of retirement very soon, starting in seven or eight years. And the baby boomers' expectations about their own livelihoods and their own prosperity were never actually fulfilled. Median wages, remember, have been relatively stagnant over the last 20 years. Baby boomers expected that their earnings trajectory over their lifetimes would roughly follow their parents' earnings trajectory and go upward, but baby boomers have been sorely disappointed. As a result, baby boomers have saved very, very little. And yet, the baby boom generation is not an unpampered generation, to speak very broadly. I can speak this way because I'm a member of it. Baby boomers expect that their retirements are going to be much better than they have any right, based upon their savings, to assume they are going to have. In fact, most baby boomers assume a kind of a med-med retirement. I use med-med as, as a shorthand for, for suggesting a cross between a club med and a medical facility. <laughs> you know, uh, snorkeling in the morning and oxygen in the afternoon. But there is no way that baby boomers are going to be able to afford this. Uh, and that means that there is going to be even greater pressure, not less pressure, but even greater pressure on Social Security and Medicare. And if you think that seniors have a great deal of political leverage today, you ain't seen nothing yet until when you see the baby boomers, all 45 million strong, born between 1946 and 1964, become a political vehicle for getting a lot of benefits. How are we ever going to pay for all of this when we already have a budget deficit of $500 billion as far as the eye can see? We have a, an economic policy based upon an assumption that if you give a tax break to very wealthy people, those wealthy people will take the tax break and turn around and invest that money in ways that will generate a lot of new jobs and prosperity. Uh, this is called supply-side economics. That's what it was called in the 1980s, uh, or trickle-down economics, on the assumption that the benefits would trickle down to everybody else. But in a global economy, it is just as likely that the extra money, the extra tax savings that rich people may get from a tax break of a sort that they've had and received will go anywhere around the world to where they can get the highest return. It is a global pool of capital searching for the highest return. It could go anywhere and is going anywhere. There is no reason to suppose that those tax savings are going to be going into the United States. It's not trickle down, it is trickle out. The only asset we have in this country that is relatively immobile, on which our future standard of living uniquely depends, is not capital. Capital is global, and capital is globally mobile. That unique asset, relatively immobile, is people, their education, their training, their health their capacity to be productive members of society. Global capital is going to go anywhere around the world it can find highly productive people. Or it's going to go anywhere around the world it can find very cheap labor. Those are the choices. And the question is, are we going to be a place where global capital comes because we're so cheap? 
or are we going to be a place where global capital comes? Because we have the productive capacity to attract global capital and at the same time charge relatively high wages. The choice is self-evident. And yet the policies we are pursuing right now are not self-evident. We would be investing substantially in education, in job training, in early childhood education. The National Academy of Sciences recently published a book which made it abundantly clear, called Neurons to Neighborhoods. I recommend it to you. It made it abundantly clear that early childhood education from age zero through five is one of the most important things we could possibly be investing in, in terms of payoff for society. Put aside social justice for a moment. Don't put aside for too long, but even from the standpoint of economic growth and development and allocative efficiency and productivity and all of those cold-blooded concerns, it makes enormous sense to invest in our people and in our children. But because we are giving big tax breaks to people at the top, we are not able to make those investments. We are disinvesting at a very rapid pace. In the 1990s, we had, by all accounts, a successful economy. We did not make nearly the investments that we should have made, I think could have made, according to what I just, and the analysis I just provided you. But we did generate 22 million net new jobs in this country. I was labor secretary through part of that time. I single-handedly created 10 million of those jobs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you can see, it wore me down. <laughs> but, and it is not George W. Bush's fault that we have lost three million jobs over the last, the last three and a half years, uh, but to the extent that there is a claim to be made, to the extent that there really is a genuine issue here, the fault is that nothing was done about it. Yes, Alan Greenspan dropped interest rates down to 1%. And yes, that generated a huge housing bubble. And I am sorry to say this because I know some of you have bought houses recently and used those low interest rates. And that's fine. Don't get excited. Don't go out and don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying there will be a bubble. I'm not saying the bubble will pop. I'm just saying that this is artificial. This is like a steroid for the system. This doesn't really build productivity in America. This doesn't build a sustainable economy. There was really and has been very little effort to get the economy back on track through both fiscal responsibility and also investments. We can do both. We tried to do both in the 1990s. We made some headway doing both in the 1990s. I think we could have done more on the investment side. We have two, had two deficits in the 1990s. One, a deficit in terms of public investment, and two, a budget deficit. We had to tackle both of them and we must tackle both of them again. It is reputed that our vice president said when his secretary of the treasury, Paul O'Neill, worried about deficits, deficits don't matter. Ronald Reagan proved deficits don't matter. Well, that is at least according to Paul O'Neill's new book. But in fact, deficits do matter. And what the Reagan administration and the current administration have done is basically generate deficits so large that they are going to starve the government, make it difficult for anybody, any Democrat, any liberal, to generate the kinds of public investments we need in the future. And so I come to another part of my prediction. Not only will a Massachusetts liberal will, in fact, John Kerry be the next president, but it is going to be very difficult for John Kerry to do very much as president other than to stop some of what's happened already. That is, the affirmative agenda for John Kerry is going to be very difficult to carry out. 
Part of that difficulty I've already alluded to. It's the huge deficits. Part of the difficulty will be that the Republicans will stay in control of Congress. They will, I predict, stay in control of Congress because there are really in the House only a relatively handful of seats up for grabs, about 30, and the Democrats have got to get too many of them in order to get a majority. It is not possible. Mathematically, it's almost impossible. I don't want to create a self-fulfilling prophecy here. Don't quote me on this. But I see it very unlikely the Democrats could get back either the House or the Senate. And so the prediction will be John Kerry will be the next president. Many of the policies we've seen will be stopped in their tracks, but it's going to be very difficult, at least in the first term of the Kerry administration, to do very much in terms of the long-term agenda of the country that needs to be done. By the way, you may be wondering who's going to be vice president. I know this. I don't know it because I have any inside information about this. I want you to know that I have no inside information. But I'm still going to tell you who my predicted pick is for vice president. Now, here again, you need to know something about my background with regard to this particular issue of vice presidents. Uh, in January of 1991, there is, again, a tape of this. <laughs> Brian Lamb on book notes on C-SPAN asked me who was going to be the next president. I told him Bill Clinton. He said, Bill Clinton? I said, yes, governor of Arkansas. He said, who's going to be vice president? I said, there is a tape. <laughs> Al Gore. January of 1991. My prescience overwhelms me sometimes. <laughs> And so the vice president, this time around, is going to be, are you ready? Are you ready for this? Are you taping me? <laughs> the vice president is going to be Tom Vilsack. Somebody say, who? <laughs> Tom Vilsack. He will be a household name. Kerry Vilsack. You still don't know who Tom Vilsack is. <laughs> How many of you know who Tom Vilsack is? How many of you don't know who Tom Vilsack is? <laughs> well, I'm appalled at your political ignorance. <laughs> Tom Vilsack is one of the most able governors in America. He is the governor of Iowa. And the reason he will be vice president, now again, this is no inside information, this is just m my judgment. The reason he will be the vice presidential candidate is that he, with vice presidential candidates, it matters much more than presidential candidates where they're from. He is from a very important swing state in the middle of a very important swing region. And he is also not a Washington player, he is a governor. You want somebody who's a governor? who's a Democrat. Now, I know there is a little boomlet for that Arizona senator, John McCain, but he's not going to be vice president. Uh, it's going to be Tom Vilsack, because Tom Vilsack is not from Washington. He is a governor. He is a, a Midwestern governor, and he has done a superb job as governor. Uh, and you will hear more about him. Uh, finally, I want to use uh, my time here uh, to say something about politics and something about democracy. Because uh, one reason I've spent half of my career in the academy teaching mostly young people is because I have a passionate belief that our democracy depends on public participation and particularly of young people. We desperately need, in this election and also in the future, people whose normal reaction to American politics is to hold their nose and to say, I think politics is dirty, to, despite those feelings, is there?
despite those feelings, to basically embrace politics and become activists again. If you ever were, if you weren't, to become activists. And by activists, I say, even if you are Republican, if you're conservative, I don't care. You need to understand and act on the principle, and this is what I teach, that politics is the applied form of democracy. If we turn our back on politics, we are turning our back on democracy, and if we turn our back on democracy, we don't have any standing to complain about what is happening in this country or even in this world. We all have an obligation, an obligation that does not end with this election day, but goes on beyond this election day to generate and activate political participation and understanding in this country. And I say participation and understanding because so many people get their news and their views in ways that are fundamentally distorted. We are on the way to eliminating the estate tax in this country. Most Americans, even though most Americans are liberal, don't call themselves liberal, most Americans believe the estate tax is a death tax that falls on everyone when they die. That is a falsehood that was perpetrated by people who wanted to get rid of the estate tax and didn't want people to know that it's only the top 2% that ever are affected, that ever are touched by the estate tax. And the estate tax is one of those very few taxes around that actually does do something to overcome widening inequality of wealth and income and opportunity in this country. It is that kind of misunderstanding that is getting us into deeper and deeper hot water. And so your responsibility your responsibility as citizens is not only to be active, and not only to be active for this particular campaign, but also to be active beyond the campaign, to be active in terms of alerting people of what's going on, sharing the news not only with your friends, but also, and here's something that is very, very important for everybody in the Bay Area and everybody in my home state of Massachusetts to do. Call 10 people in the Midwest. They are it may be friends, they may be associates, they may be acquaintances. Call them and talk to them. Engage them. If everybody on the coasts did that, my prediction that our next president will be a Massachusetts liberal will have even a better chance of being true. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Let me, actually the part of the evening that I am most looking forward to is the part that starts right now. You have been filling out questionnaires, hopefully, or little questions. Uh, Michael Nacht, uh, our wonderful dean at the Goldman School, uh, has collected them. And we're going to sit here and uh, we're going to parry a little bit. Uh, if you actually, if you have to go Please use this opportunity, uh, but uh, let's use this opportunity for us as the beginning of a, of a discussion. Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, there are more than 70 questions that I have. Uh, we, we're going to go until 10.30 p.m. <laughs> I hope that's okay with everyone. So we only have about maybe 15 minutes. So. Uh, I apologize since I will not get to most of your questions, but um, I, most of them divide into economic policy questions and political questions. So I'm going to uh, select from a, few, a few from each of those two broad categories. Uh, the largest number of economic policy questions seem to cluster around the issue of outsourcing. And here is... Uh, one version. Uh, how would you advise Kerry to address the job training needs in light of the outsourcing issues? What training will be effective for the new workforce? Uh, well, let me, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about outsourcing 
uh, particularly high technology jobs. It's natural that many people, particularly in the Bay Area, would be concerned about this. Uh, there are many computer programmers, uh, many people involved in high technology who are very nervous about this issue of outsourcing. What I say to them, and what I say to many of you, is relax. It is still a very tiny trickle of jobs. The big problem we have in this country, and the big problem that many high technology people have, is has to do with the business cycle, has to do with a very deep recession, which was led by a collapse of technology and a collapse, a collapse, uh, collapse of the dot-coms, as you all know, uh, and it has hurt high technology work a lot. But outsourcing to India, outsourcing to the Philippines, is still, with regard to high technology, a very tiny phenomenon. Over the next 18 months, or perhaps 19 or 20 months, jobs are going to come back. They may not be exactly the same jobs we had before, but jobs are coming back. The big issue we have, the big issue that we need to worry about as a country is not the number of jobs, but it's the quality of the jobs we have. That is, there is a widening gap between people who are well-educated, who have skills, whether they be technological skills, or problem-solving skills, or problem identification skills, pattern recognition skills, innovative skills, between all of those people on the one hand, and on the other hand, people who are relatively unskilled, have not got a college degree, uh, who have seen their relatively good manufacturing or other production service job basically disappear, not so much because of globalization, but even more because of technology. I was in a new factory recently in Indiana, toured it, and there were no workers. There were no employees. There were no people. It was just robots and numerically controlled machine tools. If you are unskilled, you are being shoved into the local personal service sector of the economy where jobs are plentiful, but they pay very little, and they have no benefits attached to them. That widening gap is our biggest jobs issue. Did I answer the question? I don't think I did. I, think you I did. skirted the question. <laughs> oh, what jobs, what jobs should people train for? Uh, a hard question when we don't know exactly what the jobs that, that are going to be coming back. They won't be the same old jobs. We don't know exactly what they are. To give you an example, uh, 25% of the jobs that are now being held by people in this country were not even listed in the census's 1978 listing of occupational titles. So that if 25% of the jobs that people have now were not even listed, not even imagined in 1978, it's very difficult at this stage of a business cycle to train people for jobs that we can only guess at what they might be. The most valuable training is broad-based training in creative thinking, problem solving, innovation, critical thinking. A related question that also bridges into the political is, uh, do you believe that Kerry's attacks on NAFTA and globalization are warranted, and is he taking too strong a role as a protectionist and isolationist? Uh, I don't believe, and I've watched uh, his statements, read his statements very, very carefully, that Kerry is a protectionist or he is acting in a protectionist way. Now, many Democrats, given the fact that I stressed with you that white men uh, without college degrees who had been the backbone of the Democratic Party and certainly are dominant voters in the Midwest, those manufacturing old Rust Belt states, Many of them and their families are economically very distressed, have been for years and years, have seen their economies and economic fortunes decline, and naturally Democrats are tending to be, and many labor union officials have tended to be quite protectionist in the sense of thinking that the way out of our problems is to put up tariffs or other barriers. Uh, John Kerry has not called for anything like that. The most he said is that we ought to even the playing field with regard to American tax enforcement. That is, instead of creating tax incentives for American companies to go abroad, and there are tax incentives there, you don't have to repatriate profits and ta pay taxes on the unrepatriated profits. We ought to instead charge companies, American-based companies, on taxes on all of their profitability. 
uh, and use the tax savings to provide tax breaks for companies that are generating jobs in the United States, such as a new manufacturing tax credit. What are the chances of a free fall in the value of the dollar because of these huge interest rates? Uh, the dollar has been uh, declining relative to the euro and other currencies. I don't think it's going to go into free fall, but I think the decline is going to continue. Many of you know that Warren Buffett, about three weeks ago, m placed a $12 billion bet against the dollar by buying into foreign currencies. Uh, many other international investors are doing the same thing. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more people bet against the dollar, the more the dollar is going to decline. But it is also declining because many investors look at those huge budget deficits and look at those huge trade deficits and basically look at the low personal savings rate in the United States and say, there is no way that the dollar can possibly maintain its value. Eventually, there is going to be inflation. Eventually, interest rates are going to inevitably head upward. The dollar is a bad bet. We're going to get out of dollars. Foreigners are not going to give us a billion and a half dollars a day, which is what they have been doing to support our habit. They also are diversifying their portfolios out of dollars and into, to some extent, euros and other currencies. It makes perfectly logical sense, but the consequence of a declining dollar is that everything we buy from abroad is going to cost more. And that is going to fuel inflation in the United States. What are the top three economic policy changes you would recommend in order to increase U.S. employment and wage growth? Uh, again, employment, although it is a huge problem for many people, and I don't want to in any way belittle it, is less of a problem than wage growth for people in the bottom half or bottom two-thirds of the, of the job ladder. In terms of getting jobs back, I think it may be too late for a sensible policy. I thought that a sensible policy would be to, for example, and John Kerry uh, was very much in favor of this, uh, to exempt the first $10,000 or $15,000 of income from the payroll tax for, say, a year or two. That is the kind of a tax cut that could directly put money into a lot of people's pockets and thereby, and a lot of these people whose pockets would, would be directly enriched would turn around and spend that extra money. Uh, the problem of giving a tax cut to very rich people and expecting that that's going to stimulate the economy is that the very notion is absurd. The very definition of being rich is you're already spending as much as you want to spend. You're not going to spend more if you get a tax cut from the government. Uh, and so that was, an, that, was, that, that, that was not a stimulus for the economy. That was basically throwing out a lot of money. Uh, with regard to what I consider to be the longer term challenge, and that is making sure that the bottom 60% have better chances of upward mobility, uh, therein I would put a great deal of emphasis on education, on job training, on early childhood education, as I mentioned before. Uh, we might also given the vagaries of the economic system, given the insecurities suffered by so many people as to whether they're going to keep their jobs, we might also institute something that many people have been advocating, and that is wage insurance. Not just unemployment insurance, but wage insurance. Such that if, you're, if your job is paying more and more and more, a little piece of your income or a little piece of the increment in your income might go into a fund that could be used to pay part of the difference in salary or compensation for people whose job and income are heading, are, are heading down, whose, whose incomes are actually declining. That would buffer some people from the vicissitudes of this market. It would enable people to get jobs quicker even though they may not want to settle for a job that pays much less. It would stimulate the economy in terms of getting more people back to work more quickly. And it's something that, in terms of social justice, I think we ought to do as well. There are some wonderfully interesting and clever questions on politics, so let me ask you a few of them. Please name one state that Kerry can win that Gore could not, and please do not say Florida. <laughs> Why can't I say Florida? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, Kerry, if my memory serves me correctly, I think, well, let's take, for example, Tennessee. Uh, 
Um, uh, I think actually Kerry has a very good chance of winning every state that Gore won and winning many of the states that Gore narrowly lost, like Tennessee and I believe also West Virginia. We could go through a lot of the states, uh, but remember the key battleground states are going to be those Ohio and Mississippi Valley states. Uh, Gore and Kerry has got to win every one of those states, and he will. Has any Massachusetts candidate for president named John ever lost a presidential election? <laughs> I'm going to use that fact. <laughs> actually, actually, nobody uh, who has been a Massachusetts senator with the initials JFK has ever lost. This question. Does Ker this sounds like it's a maybe not such a serious question, but it may be rather serious. Does Kerry smile enough to be president? Uh, yes. <laughs> Actually, you know, th th there, there is a germ of a, of, a, of a very important issue there, and that has to do with uh, uh, some people have said uh, that he seems aloof. Uh, I know him very well. He doesn't seem aloof to me at all. But one thing that I is interesting to me about that is that many of the same people who say that he seems a bit aloof also say that he has a, a certain gravitas about him. Uh, now maybe the two go together, I'm not sure they do go together, but I think that when I consider or uh, when my mind goes forward to the point where uh, John Kerry is going to be debating George W. Bush on television, and I think of John Kerry's uh, gravitas and appropriate seriousness, and I put that against <laughs> point made. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing that we're a nonpartisan group tonight. <laughs> yeah. Ralph Nader is poised to take significant votes away from Kerry. What can the Democrats do? Are the Democrats researching who is funding the Nader campaign? I don't know if anybody is searching who's funding the Nader campaign. I am very fond personally uh, and have been a friend, uh, I'm very fond of Ralph Nader and have been a friend of his for, for several decades. Uh, in order to be the kind of consumer champion and gadfly that Ralph Nader was in the 1970s and 80s uh, and right through the 90s to some extent, uh, you have to have a personality uh, that is one part stubborn, another part filled with self-righteous indignation, and another part delusionarily narcissistic. <laughs> uh, those, those, those qualities that are actually very important and very endearing in terms of being a consumer advocate and a crusader, uh, are not all that useful <laughs> when going into electoral politics. Uh, and I do hope, and I don't mean this in any way to denigrate Ralph Nader, I do hope that anybody here or anybody you know who is planning to vote for Ralph Nader thinks seriously about taking a long vacation in November. <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean. Think seriously about the fact that a vote for Ralph Nader is really a vote for George W. Bush. And we learned that the last time. Do you think that either Bill or Hillary Clinton will seek to sabotage the Kerry campaign for Hillary's prospects in the future? Uh, no, absolutely not. I, I, and I'm quite serious about this. I haven't seen any evidence of that. I know that some people think that that's the case. Uh, I think that both of them are going to campaign to the extent that they are asked to campaign. Both of them will be campaigning very intensively uh, for John Kerry. And I think that they both will place the fate of the nation and certainly uh, John Kerry's prospects way above their own ambitions. Two, two final questions. 
I am worried that the next presidential election will be decided by terrorism in the United States as it was in Spain. Please comment. Did you all hear that? Uh, the question was, I'm worried that the next presidential election will be decided by terrorism in the United States as it was in Spain. Please comment. Well, there are many variables, obviously, affecting this election. Uh, the economy is one, and we've talked a bit about that. Foreign policy, I've told you, is not my area of expertise, but undoubtedly, uh, the possibilities of terrorism uh, could weigh very, very heavily in this campaign uh, if they were effectuated, if we had, God forbid, another terrorist attack in the United States. I have heard the rumor, as I'm sure many of you have heard the rumor, that the Bush administration has already located and indeed is keeping in a cave in captivity Osama bin Laden and bringing him out in October. Uh, I don't think there's any truth to that. Uh, I think that the administration obviously is going to do everything it possibly can do to avoid a terrorist attack and also to try to hunt down Osama bin Laden, but it is a total wild card in this election. Okay, well, can you hear me now? The final question for Professor Reich as a soothsayer, when will you be running for president? Uh, I'm going to make a very personal announcement now that I <laughs> hope you again keep to yourselves. Uh, electoral politics is a wonderful thing. It really is a wonderful thing. I, I had more fun uh, and more heartache at running for governor of Massachusetts than I had being in President Clinton's cabinet. And I hope those of you who are able and fit and willing and have any inclination at all, or your children, uh, will get involved in electoral politics, and I mean that. Uh, it is an honor. Uh, it is one of the most noble, the noblest callings uh, there are, despite the cynicism that so many people have about politics. But having said that, I would rather be dead than run for president. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.